Welcome to part 2 of today's lecture. Next up, we look at language. Of course, this covers all the words that we speak, including dialects, including accents, including slangs. What is the origin of language? Language enables human beings to organize the world around them. Language makes it possible to teach and share values. It provides the principal means through which culture is transmitted. It allows human beings to transcend the limitations imposed by their environment and biological evolution. Now, suppose you want someone to know something. For example, uh, maybe you like someone. What are some of the ways that you may directly or indirectly tell a person? Maybe you ask the person out for dinner. Maybe you treat the person nice. You help the person when the person asks for help. Maybe you compliment the person. You look very beautiful today. Maybe you give them flowers during Valentine's Day or chocolates. Languages are not just limited by words, but it includes the different ways that we can communicate with one another. As I mentioned before, language and culture is very much closely related. You cannot learn a language without learning the culture. The words that are in a certain language shows the important things in a certain culture. All people are shaped by the selectivity of their culture, a process by which some aspects of the world are viewed as important, while others are virtually ne neglected. The Sapir-Whorf hypothesis argues that the language a person uses determines his or her perception of reality. Now, let's have a look at some examples. In the English language, how many words do we have to describe rice? The most common words would be rice and maybe porridge to describe the state of rice that you may be a cook. Some people like to use the word konji, which I think it's not that common in Malaysia. Think of how many words in Bahasa Melayu, the Malay language that you have to describe rice. First up, we have padi, which shows the rice that is being planted. And then we have beras, which means uncooked rice. And then we have nasi, which of course is cooked rice. We have bubur, which is uh, another term for porridge. We have so many terms to describe the word rice. In the Chinese language, we have words like tao to describe rice that's being planted, mi to describe uncooked rice, and fan to describe cooked rice. This goes to show the importance of rice in Asian cultures. Now, compared to that, the Europeans have different names to describe different types of bread. For example, we have baguettes, brioche, chala, chapata, cornbreads, focaccia, pumpernickel, rye bread, sourdough bread, croissants. Different names to describe different types of bread. Again, this shows the importance of bread in a certain culture. Now, take a look at this picture. It's a picture of a traditional Japanese style teacup that is frequently found in souvenir shops in Japan. Look at all the characters here. Some of you may be able to read some of the characters here, but some of them are, were actually created by the Japanese. These characters represent all the different types of fish that was found in Japan. Japan has many different kanji characters describing all the different types of fish. As you may have known, Japan is an island nation. Beef, chicken, mutton, those are meats which are not native to the Japanese. Due to Japan being an island nation, fish plays a very important part in their staple diet, as you can tell here. Here are some examples of kanji for different types of fish commonly found in Japanese cuisine. We have aji, which refers to horse mackerel. Ayu, sweet fish. Saba, mackerel. Nishin, herring. Hata hata, sailfish sandfish. Looking at all these different kanji, for the different types of fish. It's clear that the Japanese place a high importance on fish in their cuisine. Let's have a look at another example. Most of us enjoy a good tuna sandwich, but did you know that tuna has different classifications in Japan? The Japanese would classify tuna into different species. For example, they have maguro, bluefin tuna, kihada, yellowfin tuna, mebachi, 
Big Eye Tuna, Binaga Albacore Tuna, Katsuo Skipjack Tuna. To the Japanese, these are all very different fishes. But for the non-Japanese, especially to many English speakers, tuna is just tuna. Have a look at these two common Japanese dishes. Do you know what they are called? I'm sure many of you have eaten it before. Do you know what it's called? Unagi, right? Yes and no. Now take a look at this. The picture on the left is unagi, as many of you know. The picture on the right is known as anago. It's also a Japanese eel, but it's a saltwater eel. Now many of us are wondering, eels are eels, what's the difference? For the Japanese, there is a very distinctive difference between these two different types of eels. In the English language, we assign different words, um, different pronouns to different genders. He for males, she for females. In some languages, objects are seen as having different genders. For example, the word bridge. In Spanish, puente is seen as a very masculine object. The word for bridge, however, in the German lang language, Brücke, is seen as feminine. So when describing a bridge, different languages may use different words to describe it. In the Spanish language, words like strong and tall may be used to describe a bridge because it is considered to be masculine. Meanwhile, in German, words like beautiful or elegant may be used to describe a bridge because it is considered to be feminine. So based on the examples here, you can clearly see how language is very much influenced by culture and culture is very much influenced by language as well. As we proceed into the modern day age, internet users have created many many unusual or creative words for us to express ourselves on the internet. Here are some examples. How many of you know what these mean? Tweet of course means to send a message or to post something on Twitter, the online social media platform. AFAIK, as far as I know. The is used to express shock or surprise. PM or DM means private message or direct message. It's used to uh, tell someone or you want to message someone directly rather to, than to post it in the comment section. FML means my life. Again, it's an expression of disappointment, of, of, of derision that you are just so fed up with something. TFW, that feeling when, is to express a certain feeling. You know, for example, when you see something that is that makes you happy or something that makes you emotional. This one, of course, is a picture of someone flipping table. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that it's an expression of anger or, 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 or frustration or, fed up, or being fed up at something. AFK, away from keyboard. It's a term commonly used in online games to indicate that you are stepping away from the game. NSFW, not safe for work. It's used to indicate that some content shared or viewed on the internet may be of uh, 18 plus or explicit nature. TLDR, too long, didn't read. It's used to indicate it, that the message is too long and uh, I just don't have the time or energy to read it. ROTFL, rolling on the floor laughing. Used to express that you find something hilarious or funny. And OTL, now this is not an abbreviation as much as it is a usage of the shapes of uh, the letters. If you look at the shapes of the letters, it looks like a person kneeling down with the head tilted down. It's used to express exhaustion or you're tired or you're frustrated or fed up with something. You can see even in the internet age nowadays where communication has become so much more advanced, we as internet users have come up with all different different ways to express our inner self. Next up, we look at the symbolic nature of culture. What is a symbol? A symbol is anything that represents something else and carries a particular meaning recognized by members of a culture. A symbol need not share any quality at all with whatever they represent. A symbol stands for things simply because people agree that they do. Here are some examples of symbols.
Do all the pictures you see in the symbol represent the actual meaning or product? Or are they just there simply because people agree that they do? When you travel around the world, you will find many cultures and practices that are unique to that part of the world. But you would also find that there are many cultures which are similar to one another. Like for example, language. The Malay language, for example, is very much influenced by Dutch, English, Chinese, and many other languages. The English language is also very much influenced by many other languages, including French, Latin, German, and other examples. As people around the world travel more, we get to see cultures being shared and spread all around the world. Hence, you may travel to Australia, and find some examples of Malaysian culture there. I was so surprised when I was traveling around in Tokyo and I saw this Malaysian restaurant. Did you know that Malaysia is a very popular tourist destination for Japanese? Malaysia has constantly been number one on the Japanese most wanted countries for long stays. Basically, Malaysia is the country that most Japanese want to stay or retire to. Now, what do we do when we enter into a completely new and alien environment? Do we change or do we expect other people to change for us? Adaptation is the process by which human beings adjust to changes in their environment. When we go into a new environment, we need to change ourselves in order to fit into the existing culture. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Unfortunately, culture is very much a part of us, just as our skin, our muscles, our bones, and our brains. It's very difficult to change one's culture. For, like for example, I'm a Malaysian. I love Malaysian food. I love my nasi lemak, my, my mi goreng, my, my mamak food, my chak kwe tiao, you know. And uh, that's, those are the things that I really, really miss when I go overseas. How long can you live without Malaysian food? Without your nasi lemak, without your maggi goreng, without your roti canai, without your satay or chao kuei tiao. Human beings are surprisingly attached to their own culture. As cultures spread around the world, we have cultural diffusion. The movement of cultural traits from one culture to another. Today, when you travel to country like France, UK, Australia, US, Japan, you will find many Indian restaurants. For some reason, I have observed that people like Indian food. Maybe it's the flavorfulness of the spices that they use. Indian food is one type of cuisine that I seem to find everywhere. The same goes with Chinese food. Wherever in the world you travel, you seem to be able to find your dim sum, your Chinese style fried rice and uh, sweet and sour chicken, Chinese restaurants seems to be everywhere. However, when cultures are spread around the world, they tend to change. They are marked by reformulation, in which a trait is modified in some way so that it fits better in its new context. For example, where is curry from? Curry originated from India. I'm sure uh, most of us know that. Curry is so prevalent and popular all around the world that every country seems to have their own style or twist onto curry. Japanese curry, for example, is very popular in Japan. In fact, if you walk down the streets of Tokyo, you will find many curry restaurants, sometimes right next to each other. However, Japanese curry is quite different than your typical traditional Indian curry. Japanese curry seems to be a thick stew compared to uh, Indian curry, which uh, you know there are many different types of Indian curries. Chicken katsudon. If you go to many Japanese restaurants in Malaysia, you will find this dish, chicken katsudon. The traditional Japanese katsudon uses pork, but because Malaysia is a predominantly Muslim population, many of us do not eat pork. Hence the change to cater to some of our local population's uh, tastes and uh, needs. Vegetarian meat. Vegetarian meat is becoming more and more popular around the world, but from what I've observed, it is very popular among the Chinese community. Especially during Chinese New Year, you will see a lot of vegetarian meat. Basically, pieces of soy that has been uh, processed to look like actual meat. 
hip hop rock music. Now, these are two quite different genres of music, but ever since the early 2000s, many bands have uh, combined these two different styles of uh, music to create this new, new genre of music, and it has garnered a pretty good following. Next up, we look at cultural lag. Cultural lag describes the phenomenon through which new patterns of behavior may emerge, even though they conflict with traditional values. Now, cultural practices changes over time, whether it be wedding practices, whether it be religious practices, how we deal with relationships, love, education, and a, a communication, all the different lifestyles. Cultural lag describes situations where people, usually the older generation, have trouble following or keeping up with the latest uh, styles and technologies perhaps like maybe your grandfather who seems to have trouble using a smartphone or your grandmother who doesn't seem to understand when you're using your computer to do your assignment another term that we look at is subcultures deriving from two words sub meaning under or below and cultures subcultures refers to the distinctive lifestyles, values, norms, and beliefs that certain segments of population within a society follow. It's essentially a society within a society. As many of you have observed, we do have many subcultures. Like for example, one may say that, oh, there's Malay culture, but then there is the Kelantan culture. There is the Chinese culture, and then you may have your Hokkien or your Hakka culture. Then again, the younger generation may also subscribe to uh, different popular cultures, which can be considered under this umbrella as well. Fans of K-pop, anime, cosplay, goth, punk. These are just examples of popular culture, which can be considered under the subculture umbrella. Now, we move on to the topic of the incest taboo, marriage and family. Marriage is a topic that we will very much cover in one of the upcoming chapters, but what is a taboo? A taboo refers to a prohibition of a certain action. Basically, it's something that you must never, never do according to a certain culture. For example, wearing black during Chinese New Year or giving the gift of a clock in Chinese culture. These are all considered examples of taboo in Chinese culture. And another example of a taboo is incest. What is incest? Incest refers to sexual relations between family members. Why is incest considered taboo or forbidden in many cultures? Incest has a relatively high chance of producing children which tend to be handicapped, uh, mentally or physically impaired. This is one of the major reasons why incest is a taboo in many, many cultures. As many of us grow up from being a child to adulthood, we experience many things that teaches us uh, the ways of life, that teaches us how to live. Rites of passage are basically standardized rituals marking major life transitions. Every culture has its rites of passages, whether it be the sunat, Malay circumcision ritual, baptism, baby's first month celebration, getting your driver's license, leaving your home for college, your first date, your first kiss, marriage, coming out, your first job, your first house, your first child. Now these are examples of rites of passage that many of us, depending on your culture, may experience during our lifetimes. They are by no means easy. So who guides us during these times? It could be our family members, it could be our friends, it could be our relatives, it could be uh, members of our community, like for example, uh, people who are of the same religion, people in our church maybe, people in our uh, group, whatever it is, our friends. Rites of passages typically involves other people other than the individual that is going through this experience. And last up, we look at ideology. What is ideology? Ideologies are strongly held beliefs and values and are the cement of social structure. This includes political ideology, religious ideology, ideologies about gender, sex, family, food, clothing, 
how important are some of these elements to, to us? How important is your political ideology, for example? Are you a leftist? Are you a rightist? Do you believe in free speech? Do you believe that certain things like guns and drugs should be tightly controlled by the government? Are you a religious person? How does it make you feel when someone makes fun of or insults your religion? Should that person be punished? Or is it his or her right to express their opinions? What are your thoughts on the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transsexual community? Do you think that they should have equal rights, the same as every other individual? What is your idea of family? Does family have to be blood related or are they just people who are very close together? Would you ever call a friend, a brother or a sister? What are your thoughts on clothing? Should people be allowed to wear whatever they want, express themselves with their clothing? What if a student showed up for class with uh, bad words like, you know, you, you know, written on their shirt? Should that be allowed? Should a person be allowed to wear a bikini you know, and, and walk around the streets or, or even walk around naked? Keep in mind that some of, while some of you may find this disgusting or strange, there are some people around the world who find this to be perfectly normal. Take the nudist communities. If you were to wear clothes in a nudist community, you would be the strange one or you, be, you would be the unusual one. The idea of nudist is, I was born naked. It's natural to be naked. So it's perfectly natural for me to walk around naked. It's strange for us to be wearing clothes to cover up our body. So what do you think? Has this lecture changed your ideas about culture? What is considered to be normal, abnormal, strange? In the study of sociology, it is important to keep an open mind that what we consider to be normal may be considered to be stupid or strange or unusual to other people, vice versa. Could it be us who needs to change our thinking and be more accepting of other people's cultures? That's something to think about. And that brings us to the end of this week's lecture. I'll see you next week.